Uh, I think I'm, yeah, let me just say because I think this is going to be on Zoom also. Yeah. And uh, well, in case there are some people also in YouTube. So thanks a lot for coming in this very short notice uh, because this seminar was organized yesterday evening actually. And uh, and uh, so it's a, a pleasure that, uh, that, yeah, that we managed to organize it. So, so the speaker today is going to be at Sushi. Weda, who is a PhD student at the University of Tokyo, the group of uh, Masaki Yoshikawa. You know, this is um, a very strong group on the strongly correlated systems. And, uh, and yeah, Sushi has been visiting for a while already, but time flies, which I realized that. And, and then he's flying back to Tokyo on Friday. <laughs> and, uh, and he's going to be talking to us today about visualizing the renormalization group flows with tensor networks. And um, yeah. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, first, thank you very much for the introduction and yeah, giving me this opportunity. Today, I will talk about my research paper from last year about this one. And maybe, I, I don't think I will talk about this one, but this is these two are related. And uh, this is our attempt to visualize the renormalization group flows of the 2D classical model, the lattice model with a tensor network. And my collaborator is Asaki Oshikawa, is my professor. Okay, so today's goal is shown here. So when you try to solve the problem, what you do is try first try to make a simple model, like a classical XY model. And you find some interesting feature like a topological phase transition. Then what you do as a physicist usually is that take a continuum limit to like deal with a field theory. And then you go back from sine Gordon model to speculate what happens. So this is purely conceptual, but in this talk, I try to show you and demonstrate the procedure to get a uh, running coupling constant of the field theory from the actual lattice model. And this is one of the results that you compute running coupling constants for various temperature and system sizes and just plot it. And this plot indeed coincide with the uh, famous Kostaditz Flow. Sorry. Sushi. Yes. Yeah. One second. So they just told me, can you share the screen in Zoom also? No. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> because. Okay. Good. Yeah, now it's working. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay, so that's my attempt today. Okay, I was expecting broad background today, but seems like there are a lot of specialists, so I will go quickly. But okay, so let me start from the simple case, which is Eisen model. And the Hamiltonian is uh, expressed as this. And this uh, model has a phase transition because energetically, two spins are aligned together. But entropically, it should be random. So there should be at some temperature, final temperature, that causes the phase transition. And this phase transition, this model, is a really famous model to describe the magnets in the simplest case. And what is important about this phase transition is that at criticality, the spin spin correlation decays polynomially. For example, uh, spin spin correlation of the Eisen model can be described with this one, and this x sigma is called a critical exponent. And regardless of the microscopic details, it is known that 
for the same university classes, these critical exponents coincide with each other, such as liquid gas transition in, in the same dimension. Uh, for now, I was talking about the like the general dimension, but today we're going to talk about two dimension because in two dimension theory called conformity theory has a strong uh, constraint on the theory. And in this conformity theory, uh, there are operators, and the correlation function of the primary operators decays with the power law. And we denote its scaling dimension as Xn. And this university class can be defined by a set of operator uh, phi n and uh, what is called central charge C. In the case of the Eisen university class, this is summarized here. And the surprising thing is that the with conformal field theory, we can exactly determine the scaling dimensions and the central charges. So this CFT can be applied as long as spatial and time dimension in the sum is two. So we can also apply it to the 1D quantum systems. And for example, this is a transverse field Eisen model in one dimension. And this goes through the quantum phase transition at J equal gamma. And this up criticality, when you move the gamma in the parameter space, the excitation gap, gap from the ground state to the first excited state closes. And these continuous energy levels are described by CFT, conformal field theory. More precisely, in the conformal field theory, operator like a phi n and excitation in the energy has a correspondence. For example, uh, spin wave uh, excitation of the M rotation from to the left to the right corresponds to the E to the IM theta acting on the vacuum. The finite size gap reflects the scaling dimension. So thus we can calculate this XM scaling dimension of the nth operator by linearly fitting the gap between them by changing the system sizes. But this is purely quantum 1D system. So in the classical 2D system, you don't have energy levels sometimes. So but nevertheless, you can always consider 2D critical 2D classical system as a 1D system using the quantum classical correspondence. And we find that the uh, eigenvalues of L times L transfer matrix uh, contracted in X direction, the eigenvalue lambda N can be expressed with the mapped energy level EN as this one. And combining this equation, this equation, we find that just by taking the ratio of two eigenvalues of the transfer matrix into the classical system, you can get scaling dimension. That is very cool. Uh, for those who is not familiar with tensile network in classical 2D system, uh, we first express local Boltzmann weights as a tensor. In the case of Eisen model, which is this one, local Boltzmann weights is this one, this one, this one, this one. You can uh, express local Boltzmann weight as a tensor A with a four leg tensor with one dimension two. And by contracting local tensor, you can make a square lattice, which is called tensile network. And by contracting the legs in the X direction, you can make a transfer matrix in Y direction. So, so far, we know that this, all we need to calculate the scaling dimension or the university class is just the eigenvalue of the transfer matrix. 
But you know, the best way to obtain the eigenvalue of the transform matrix is called the uh, tensor network renormalization. This is a uh, simplified uh, GIF. But basically, tensor network renormalization is a scheme of the real space renormalization. And at each step, you redefine the local tensor and the effective system sizes become L equal square root of two and to the power of N. And at criticality, you do the scale invariance by doing this procedure for a few steps, this renormalized tensor quickly converges to what it's called fixed point tensor. And what you need to do is just uh, uh, calculate the eigenvalues of the fixed point tensor and take the ratio to get the scaling dimension. This was indeed successfully uh, shown by Chen Chang Gu in 2009. And this is an uh, example of calculated data from the Eisen model. Um, on the left panel is the uh, central charge. And as you can see, if you go to the RG steps, this central charge quickly converges to 0 0.5, which is a safety uh, prediction. The same thing can happen for the scaling dimension. So it is nowadays, we know that the, it's a, this TNR is a really good way to numerically compute the central charge and scaling dimension, that's the university classes. Okay, this is kind of introduction. Question. Okay. What are, what are other quantities such as the topological spin and so on? Okay, so topological state, topological phases, uh, or which one? Uh, topological spin. So what happens if I make a twist to the uh, CFT? I mean, other. I mean, what I mean is other quantities apart from central charge and spinning dimensions. Can you also get them from the fixed point tensor? Uh, like, uh, could you say it again? Sorry. So apart from the central charge mm -hmm. and the scaling dimension, so are there any other quantities that you can compute from the fixed point tensor? Okay, so this is like a, a, a gapless case. So in the case of the gap case, you can also get a topological states as a fixed point tensor. But like in this simple case, you cannot get, you only get the, Operator contents in the periodic boundary function. Mm. Okay, am I might. okay? So this is like a previous research, and for a tensile network specialists, we somehow know and we appreciate it. So the main focus of this time is that what happened when we are simulating the system away from the criticality. So for example, on the left panel, we calculate the scaling dimension of the critical temperature. And we see indeed, it converges to the fixed point tensor at certain level. But as you know, if the temperature is shifted from the critical temperature, you, all, you don't get the convergence, but you, actually see the divergence of the scaling dimension. Uh, however, we found that by ana analytically analyze this divergence, you can also get the information about the RG flow. Uh, so standard perturbative renormalization group theory says that the lattice models in a given lattice model near the criticality can be understood as a perturbed Hamiltonian to the scale invariant Hamiltonian like this one. So this is a perturbation term. And for example, if you have uh, this non-zero coupling constants of the relevant operator here, and the initial coupling constants can be given with a 
L equal one. So you start from here. Then all the parameter that start from on the right side of the phase goes to the high temperature phase as the system cut sizes increases. And uh, the other way around, if you start from here in this RG flow diagram, you go to the low temperature phase. So in other words, you can say that this relevant perturbation, size dependent relevant perturbation separates the phase. And this plot of GL in various system sizes called uh, RG flow. So now we want to get some RG information from X and L that we show you. It's like a divergence. We can actually do it easily. We start from this Hamiltonian, and this is a perturbative term. And with a standard perturbation theory in undergraduate study, you can express the energy correction as this one, and B is this one. And with a CFT, you can also compute this quantity as this one, and you ended up with a finite collection of the finite size scaling dimension as this one. So you can see, for example, in the case of the high temperature phase, what happened was that the, the initial value is one over eight. But as the system size increases, this GJL diverges. So eventually X and L go away from the true value of one over eight. Okay, let me go back to the TNR. So TNR effectively simulate the system sizes of L to the square root of two power of N after any step or RG transformation that I explained before. So one can efficiently calculate the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix lambda N as with this one, just by contracting the X direction. And then you can easily get X and L. And using this X, uh, X and L calculated from numerical value. And using this equation, you get this quantity, which is nothing but the running coupling constants. Okay, let me briefly summarize. First, we start from the part of Hamiltonian from the scaling variable Hamiltonian. And then we calculated the uh, part of it to correct correction to the scaling dimension as this one. And thus this GJL can be calculated from by subtracting X and L minus true value. And this X and L, as I explained before, can numerically access from the GNR. So basically you subtract the true value and get the uh, running coupling constants. For example, we can do it with the Eisen model. First, with the TNR, we calculate XNL. And with a standard calculation of CFT, you get without a uh, without a magnetic field, x n x sigma l can be expressed as this quantity, g t at the initial coupling constants is proportional to the uh, t minus t c. And then we plot this quantity, and then we get g t for various system sizes. You can do the same thing for a g h and you get this diagram. Uh, in this diagram, Z axis is a system sizes going up from down. So as you increase the system sizes, you go down. So what you see here is that 
you start from in the vicinity of the fixed point. And then when you put up, adjust a little bit and system use increase the system size, you get this RG flow away from the fixed point, which is a uh, simple RG flow. Another example that I want to show, because this one is a little bit simple and boring, is the topological distribution. So as we you may know that the XY model has this a topological phase transition, which is driven by the dissociation of the vortex and the vortex pair. And this transition can be described by a sine Gordon model as this one with a shift of temperature and the vortex and the vortex uh, kind of inverse of chemical potential. And using the standard perturbative theory, Costalitz derived a famous R Costalitz RG equation as this one. And the RG flow diagram is this one, just by solving the equations. So just to review, uh, initial coupling of the lattice models, let's assume we start from this orange lines. And then you increase the system size for the low temperature phase, you go into the fixed line C equal one Gaussian fixed point, but for a higher temperature, you just go away. So there is a boundary between two phases, it is called BKT line. So, but uh, I explain it in an easy way, but uh, like in general, this is like a, we we conceptually well understood it, but in general, we cannot compute the RG flow numerically from the lattice model, unlike the heat capacity or the magnetization with the Monte Carlo simulation. On the other hand, with the same way as Eisen model, you can calculate the uh, coupling constants of the XY model from the lattice model. So that's what I did. And I think it will be amazing if you can just plot the data from the numerical result and regain this diagram that is a theoretical concept. And it was right. The figure on the right is the actual RG flow that I got from the TNR. And each point represent, it's a small points, but it's a, each point represent the running coupling constants of the system sizes from 16 to 512. And we indeed see that the clear phase separation that is predicted by costlets. And one more surprising thing is that the, on the boundary of the BKT line, which is 0 0.83, uh, 2.893. It is consistent with the best estimate of the transition temperature from previous study up to three digits. So we, as a conclusion, we found that just by plotting the outer <coughs> flow, you see the phase, phase separation without doing anything. And to our best knowledge, this is first direct proof of the celebrated costalit RG flow. And indeed, and it is indeed happening in the XY model. Okay, maybe the talk was a little bit short. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no worries. Okay. So as a summary, in the first part, we showed that the uh, we can calculate the RG flow of the 2D critical uh, 2 d model in the vicinity of critical model using the tensile network normalization and CFT. And then we demonstrated that it is indeed working well for the 2D XI model and the ISIM model. So thank you very much.
Thanks a lot. Um, so I see Luan is actually connected online and uh, great. Questions, comments? Remarks? I have a question actually. So what you, I mean, you were talking all the time about PNR and so on, but you didn't talk about bond dimensions, no? And okay. Errors. So uh, that's a very good question. And the, okay, it's another slide, I guess. So if there is no other question, maybe I can talk about bond dimension. So the idea is that uh, you can consider finite bond dimension effect as a also perturbative uh, term. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see it from the same method. And uh, okay, let me show you. Oh, I'm sorry, it is in Japanese, but I'll explain. Mm -hmm. So the mechanism is the same. So the finite bond dimension effect is uh, significant when you calculate in the critical systems because you based what you do you know basically in the tnr is just approximating this Hilbert space to just the this is crazy and in the case of the gap system the schmidt value decays exponentially so you don't mind but in the case of the critical system you have this uh long tail information so you this Got a lot of eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. That's a that's the origin of the finite bond dimension effect. And this is like a well-known effect. If you try try to calculate the central charge with a super low bond dimension, you see some collapse of the central charge, even though you're simulating the critical system. But what you can do is uh, th this delta x sigma is a uh, uh, x n x sigma l minus the true value. So this is a deviation from the true value that you expect. Maybe you have. Oh, yes, the, the Eisen model, by considering the irrelevant perturbation, uh, this deviation of XNL minus the true value can be uh, described with this one. And since you don't have a relevant perturbation, it should uh, converge to the true value zero proportional to one over L square. But what you find for the a finite bond dimension, which is, this is our demand bond dimension four, eight, 12, which is small. You initially get this uh, good convergence to the true value, but there is some breakdown at a certain level. And the more, the less bond dimension you have, uh, the faster you get this divergence. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is that you can speculate that this point, this length scale is a finite bond dimensional uh, correlation length. 
And the best known finite bond dimension correlation length is the one from the MPS uh, from Frank Bowman in 2011 or something. And which is this one due to the copper. And copper is this one. And if you plot this uh, finite bond dimension effect with respect to a finite bond dimensional correlation lengths, then all of these values collapse with each other. This means that this collapse uh, indeed happen at the finite bond correlation lengths scale. And this correlation length scale indeed is uh, one from the flunk puma. And this is the result from the Eisen model, but you can do with a, the same thing with a three-step POTS model and you see the perfect uh, collapse for the three-step POTS model mm -hmm. with a different central charge. So with this one, you can say that the, uh, the finite correlation lengths for the TNR is also the same as MPS. And like this divergence, if you see this divergence, it, it's a log log plot and it is straight line. And if you see this tilt, you see this operator, this tilt is the same as the G epsilon perturbation, which is like a, you're basically simulating the system away from the critical temperature. And this, this flow and the uh, flow of the, uh, away from the critical temperature coincide with each other. And as a result, you can consider finite bond dimension Hamiltonian as a uh, CFT plus relevant perturbation. And in this case, this relevant perturbation is a temperature shift, which is epsilon. And I conjecture that it is always the most relevant perturbation in the field theory that comes up. Okay. Great. So I mean, you completely answered my question. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to ask you about how is the effect of the errors where you have been doing entanglement scaling and everything since you are at a CFT. So great. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for the question. So no, this is this is great. It's a very in-depth analysis. So that's great. More questions? One. One. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm no specialist, but just to to a little bit. Okay. Please. What's the origin of your uh, energy quantization? It is due to the size or due to the coloration lens? It is the uh, energy quantization? Yeah, yeah. You mean the, at the critical, tem critical okay, yeah. parameter? You, you quantize uh, your it is uh, due to the finite size. Size. But what happens when the size is larger than coloration lens? Correlation. That's a very because, good question. Uh, System doesn't know about now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the size, no? Yes. So, what happens when the system sizes goes upper? Then less and less is uh, it's small. Let's say. Then you get a uh, uh, gap system. Okay. Let me show you. So there is a crossover between. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but uh, okay, let me show you this slide. Uh, so in the critical system, when you calculate the deviation from CFT, you see, you, you should see the convergence to zero. But uh, when you're simulating the temperature away from the critical temperature, which is this, you actually see some crossover to convergence and this divergence. 
And in the middle is a correlation length. So if I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, mm -hmm. but when the system size is larger than correlation length, uh, this RG flow behaves like a, a gapped system. But on the other case, you even though you have the finite correlation lengths, you have RG flow like a, a gap, gapless system. Yep. Do I answer your question? Okay. I think because for me, it's every time it's a problem. I think many other uh, uh, fields, it is, it is important when you have uh, current or whatever, then how to, to reach the quantization, for instance. Uh, in our case, we get uh, just doing physical borders, no, just the size. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wonder whether in any system it's possible to just use correlation again, so it is, has some mm -hmm. effect on the, mm -hmm. on the uh, somehow quantization for very low temperature. Mm -hmm. That's okay, very maybe it is not for you, just for general. That's very interesting. interesting. Yes. Is how you 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 touch this problem in your field or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in our case, yes, we try to confine the electrons, but um, every time the question is, what happens in, uh, if the losses are very strong? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I up to which uh, scale I can confine actually. Yes. Your system is more complicated, uh, complex uh, actually. Maybe. Uh, when, in this case. Okay, just yeah. for it is some. Yeah, kind of, thank you for the good comments. I, yeah. Whether you see something or just maybe something. Mm -hmm. You think or thought or whatever. <laughs> okay, I see, I see there is a question online. Okay. Uh, Luan, I don't know if you can hear us. You can just unmute yourself and talk. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Hi. Let me see. Hello. Oh, yeah, it's just, so I don't know if I'm. Oh, hello. Oh, it's in here. It's in the chat. Okay. Hello, Atsushi. So, in previous results, I mentioned for the boundary conditions. Okay. TBC. This is twisted boundary conditions. If so, there is any special reason to use it for BKT transition and how it can affect the effectiveness of the loop TNR code? That's a very, very good question. Yeah. So, why TBC? So, uh, okay, I'll show you. So twisted boundary condition, you don't need it actually, but we introduce it because of the finite bond dimension effect. Uh, in general, finite bond dimension effect is serious for higher energy level. And even though if you have a lower, uh, finite bond dimension effect, you can also always minimize the, the effect by considering the lower energy levels. Because lower energy levels is corresponds to the largest eigenvalues. And so uh, by twisting the boundary condition, you actually, okay, this one is what, uh, what is your name again? Luan. Yeah. So Luan is talking about this place that the you is you might not need a twisted boundary condition. But uh, what I'm doing by twisting boundary condition is that you can without twisting boundary condition, the energy level of this one is gonna be times larger, which means that 
if you twist the boundary condition, uh, this quantity, these energy levels appear as a largest eigenvalue. But if you don't, you, you get this kind of uh, energy level at 10s or 11s or 16s, which might cause a significant finite bond dimension effect. Do I make sense? So what I mean is that the, when you calculate the scaling dimension, for example, uh, this one and this one tends to be more precise than these eigenvalues. And by twisting the boundary condition, I, I pull up these eigenvalue to the lowest eigenvalue because uh, because the half half charge is not realized without twisting boundary condition. Does that make any sense? Or do you have additional comments? No more questions on the chat. I see, thank you and congratulations. Okay, so <laughs> very good. Okay, thank you. sorry. More questions or comments or remarks? But thank you for the good question. Okay, so if not, um, yeah, as I said, Sushi is uh, going to be leaving on Friday. So he's going to be here still today and tomorrow. No? Yes. Um, so in case you want to have a chat with him before he, he leaves. Okay. And um, yeah, so if there are no more questions, uh, yeah, let's thank Atsushi once again. Thank you very much. And um, thanks a lot for this very nice seminar. And uh, thanks everybody for coming. And now I'm gonna finalize the.